Hello, I'm Murray Carter. Today I want to briefly explore the question, what is traditional Japanese bladesmithing? Surely when we think of traditional Japanese bladesmiths, we think of a man in a dark forge, forge welding or laminating mild steel to hard carbon steel, either in two layer or three layer laminates. We think of the traditional Japanese uh, swordsmith forge welding tamahagane, which is the sword's raw material, over and over again to purify it and making you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of layers of steel. We think of the bladesmith forging the laminated steel in a coke and pine charcoal fire. We think of the bladesmith who is coating blades in clay before quenching and annealing them in exotic materials like rice, straw, ashes. Surely Japanese traditional bladesmithing is all of those things, but it's actually something more, something that isn't so obvious. I think after having forged over 17,000, close, closer to 18,000 blades in my 24 year career of Japanese bladesmithing, that the heart and soul of traditional Japanese bladesmithing is the focus and mindset of the bladesmith. That is, the bladesmith is focused on how he can improve the metallurgical qualities of the steel and how he can create a blade that is going to have superior cutting performance in the end result. One thing he'll do is ensure that he has a carbon rich fire. Uh, he's going to be burning really clean uh, fuel such as uh, coke which is coal that has been heated once for all of the volatile gases to be burned off and the preferred uh, fuel of choice is going to be pine charcoal which is a very clean and very carbon rich uh, fuel. And he's going to make sure that when he heats his steel in the fire that he's not inserting the steel into the oxidizing part of the fire which is near the uh, air source but rather he's going to put it in the neutral or the carburizing part of the fire again to uh, further purify the steel and possibly to enhance its uh, cutting potential by helping it absorb some more carbon. When the traditional Japanese bladesmith forge welds, his goal is to do it at the lowest possible temperature. I often tell people that when I forge weld 10 billets of steel, the Japanese gokunan tetsu to say for example Hitachi white steel, and when I forge those 10 billets into knives and then I heat treat them and I'm grinding the knives, if I see that all 10 of those knives or those billets of steel were perfectly forge welded, I have a, a sense of uh, disappointment. And that seems counterintuitive until I explain the fact that because my goal is to forge weld them at the lowest possible temperature, what I'm expecting to see out of those 10 billets are one or two of them to be not quite perfectly forge welded. I want to see little black lines, little cold shuts, little imperfections. If I achieve that, that means that the other eight that are perfectly forge welded were forge welded at the lowest possible temperature. On the other hand, if all 10 billets are perfectly forge welded, that probably means I was a little high on the temperature and I could have forge welded them at a little bit lower temperature, right? The borderline, because that's what we want. Now we've put the mild steel with the carbon steel core back in the fire for the most important and most critical process in the whole knife making and that's called forge welding. The goal is to heat the steel up to a temperature where the metals will fuse together but without overheating them.
another step that we take as a traditional Japanese bladesmith to enhance the final cutting performance of blades is to successively forge the billet or the blade at a lower and lower temperature. Let's say, for example, it takes five forging operations to make a kitchen knife or an outdoor blade. Every time I pull the steel out of the fire in order to hammer it, it should be at a lower temperature than the forging operation before it. That culminates in the annealing temperature, which is going to be not one degree hotter than it needs to be for the grain structure inside the steel to uh, reach a, a nice relaxed state. If there's an ideal temperature for annealing, we want to hit that ideal temperature and not be one degree beyond. I'm going to heat this blade again to a dull cherry red color, aiming for about 750 degrees Celsius. And we're going to put it in this bucket of rice straw ashes. And we're going to let it cool until the temperature drops at least below 250 degrees Celsius. This will relieve any stresses that are in the steel from the forging process. So that doesn't look like much now, but if we flick out the lights, you'll see it's the perfect annealing temperature. After we anneal the blade, the traditional Japanese bladesmith, in a huge gamble, is going to cold forge the steel in that blade. Now there's always a risk with too much cold forging that you could create cracks in the steel, which, which of course would be, lead to a, a, a failure in the, in the final blade. And how much cold forging the bladesmith does is kind of a matter of personality, but the ideal is to cold forge it to the very maximum limit, just one hammer blow shy of propagating any cracks in the steel, taking it to the absolute max. After the cold forging, when the blades are quenched, similar to annealing, we want to heat the steel and that blade to the critical temperature, to the exact temperature where when the blade is quenched in water, it will fully harden. But once again, not one degree above that temperature. That is the goal. And in order to ensure that the blade is going to fully harden, we need to soak the blade in the fire for between you know, 15 or 45 seconds, depending on the thickness of the blade. We have to soak it in the fire. That's a good 1,500 degrees hotter than the temperature we're looking for in our blade, but we have to soak it in such a way that it stays right at that perfect critical temperature and not one degree higher. After quenching the blade, we need to temper the blade again over the flames of the fire. Now we want to temper the blade to give the steel a little bit of resiliency and a little bit of flexibility and toughness, but not one degree more than is going to compromise the cutting potential of the steel. We're looking for a blade that will cut and amaze people with its cutting performance, not be so tough that you could pry ammunition cans open with it. The Japanese bladesmith is looking always to achieve an amazing amount of cutting potential in the steel. And the tempering is done minimally. When the Japanese traditional bladesmith quenches his blade in water, which again is the most severe quenching medium, but that is what is necessary to bring out the absolute full potential that the steel has to offer in terms of Rockwell hardness. Ideally, the blade goes into the water at or about 800 degrees Celsius, depending on whether it's a white steel or blue super steel or tamahagane, but thereabouts within 20 degrees, plus or minus. And the goal is to pull the blade out of the water at 250 degrees Celsius. 
not after the blade reaches the ambient temperature of the quenchant of the water. If the bladesmith pulls this, the blade out of the quenchant too soon, then full hardness will not be achieved and the, the residual heat inside the blade will uh, move out towards the, the edges and it'll, it'll ruin the quench or it'll over temper it. And so rather than play it safe and leave the blade and the quench it until it reaches the same temperature as the water, which would be about 38 degrees Celsius, we're trying to quench it quickly from 800 to 250 and then basically to let it air cool from 250 degrees to the ambient room temperature. So we've discussed some very special techniques and steps the traditional Japanese bladesmith goes through to ensure that he is achieving the maximum potential that the steel has to offer so that he can create a blade with superior cutting performance. Just forging a katana or just making a Japanese sickle or just you know, doing some of these uh, exotic uh, shapes and going through the motions doesn't ensure or it doesn't alone qualify or quantify what a traditional Japanese bladesmith is. It is a mindset. It is a bold and intrepid mindset of the man who is willing to try to take the steel to the very maximum potential with great risk and great gamble. I kind of liken this procedure to uh, a game that we play at home with the kids called Pass the Pigs. It's a game where you roll two pigs, uh, like a dice game, and uh, in many cases you're kind of going for all or nothing. You start to accumulate points, but if you roll a bad hand, then you, then you get zero for that hand. So it's like trying to start at zero and and, and win the game all in, all in one turn and just going for it one step after another after another taking risk and taking gambles to try to make or try to, to achieve the best result possible. One manifestation of this traditional Japanese bladesmithing mentality is this blade I'm holding. As an experiment I forge welded uh, some steel cable which in and itself isn't very high quality steel. But I forge welded cable into a billet and then I forge welded some substandard, some anchor bolt mild steel onto the outside of it. And I did this with the utmost care and attention. And then I uh, forge welded at the lowest possible temperature. And then I forged it to shape with subsequently lower and lower heats and then annealing it to a temperature which I thought or felt wasn't one degree hotter than it needed to be. After annealing I cold forged it to the, put, to the point where I thought man I better not, I'll just hammer it two more times. I took it to the absolute max. Then I coated it in clay and quenched it in water and then tempered it to a temperature where I just dared not heat it even one degree hotter because I wanted to leave as much potential in that steel as possible. In other words, I treated it and focused on the metallurgy and treated it exactly as any other uh, blade that a traditionally mindsetted Japanese bladesmith would do. And then after grinding it on the rotating water stones and sharpen it by hand. I cut a myriad of different materials with it and was absolutely amazed at the superior performance I got out of a substandard material. And this I believe is a manifestation of the Japanese bladesmithing mindset. 
I don't tout this as being the world's most superior blade, but I took substandard materials. And with this bold and daring mindset in when, when bladesmithing, I was able to vastly improve the potential of this steel. So I just wanted to take the time today to talk about this because, you know, obviously to some people, when I uh, label my YouTube videos as traditional Japanese bladesmithing, people say, well, he's Caucasian or he's not doing it exactly the way I've seen other Japanese bladesmiths do it on YouTube and so on. And admittedly, visually there are some differences. But I want you to consider that traditional Japanese bladesmithing is a mindset and a focus on the metallurgy with an eye towards improving the metallurgical properties of the steel through heat and time and hammering. The next time you viewers see traditional Japanese bladesmiths, I mean a Japanese national bladesmith, a native Japanese person, or me or other people when they're bladesmithing, Try to look at the not so obvious things and try to see really where their heart and focus is. I hope that this little discussion helps you understand what I believe and what I value as being traditional Japanese bladesmithing mindset and techniques. Thanks for watching. I'm Murray Carter with Carter Cutlery. Stay sharp.